All right, so we're going to begin. We're holding chapter 48, Perek Mem Chet in Tehillim. This one is relatively short and quite easy to follow. It is the last chapter for the, for the time being that discusses what will happen when Mashiach will come. This follows, if you recall, various chapters that David Melech describes about the suffering, the pain of the galut, of the exile. The Jewish people, he already knows, he already foretells, will go through many troubles, many persecutions, very difficult times. And now he wants to encourage them and, re and remind them that there will be better times. Not only better times, they will be so beautiful that they will completely erase and make us forget all the pain and suffering that we ever had. Imagine a woman going through labor pains. It's so difficult for her. The rabbis tell us that she even swears, no more children after this. But once she holds the baby in her hands and she begins to nurse him or her, she says it was worth it. <laughs> so that is the type of feeling that we will all have. But it's not only the Jewish people. The non-Jewish world will come to understand that which they never understood, that which they never believed to be true. That there's an almighty God who rules over the entire universe and who's aware of our thoughts and our actions. And he's so involved that we can turn to him in prayer, we can beseech him. So much that the non-Jewish world is unaware of, that Judaism teaches. And that is why Sefer Tehillim is so special, so important. It's not only full of beautiful poetry and song and praise, it also has a lot of prophecy. It also gives us a way of understanding many of God's ways, which are so puzzling. And here David HaMelech, through song and praise, shares with us his own personal experiences, but also what we should be expecting in order to instill in us the hope that there is something to look forward to, which is one of the principles in Judaism, that Mashiach will come. The Bet HaMikdash that is now destroyed, and the location is pretty much desolate, even though there's a couple mosques over there, will eventually be rebuilt. And it will be so much more beautiful than anything we can ever imagine. And he's going to give us a little bit of detail, just a little bit, of what we can expect. So this Perek begins again with the children of Korah, because tradition says that they composed it. And David incorporated it into Tehillim. So according to one opinion, they are the ones saying these words, these prophetic words. Shir Mizmor Livne Korah. A song, a psalm by the sons, by the sons of Korah. So what's interesting about this first pasuk, very short verse, is that it says Shir Mizmor. We are very accustomed to seeing the words Lam to the conductor. Words are being put together and composed for a conductor to play, to sing. Here, there's an, there's an emphasis on Shir Mizmor. This is a double song, a song and a praise. In other words, that this is something not of the ordinary. This is something special, something unique. Livne Korach to the sons of Korach. Gadol Adonai hu mehulal me'od. So he follows with the next pasuk that Hashem, the Lord, He's great, and he's ex exceedingly acclaimed or praised. Where? In the city of God, his holy mountain. Okay, these are somewhat familiar words to us. He's great, he's praised. But remember the context. What's the context here? Yemot HaMashiach, the Messianic era. So here, He's really talking to the entire world, or about the world. The reaction of those who will be alive at the time, that it's not only the Jewish people who are going to say so, it's not only the Muslims, it's all the people who are still around, who will merit to be around when Mashiach comes. They will become aware how great Hashem is. Remember, there are many philosophies that have existed and still exist today about this great, this great God. Some don't even believe it. Some don't think that he exists. But even those who do exist have different understandings of who he is, what he is, 
this great power. Some say he created the world, but is he involved? Does he know what's going on? If he does, then how could he allow six million Jews to die, innocent children, righteous people? And one of the most interesting books that I highly recommend that delves into the topic of why the righteous suffer is the Sefer of Yov, as it's called in English, Job. And it's not so easy to understand what, what's going on in that book. There are a lot of difficult Hebrew words there. But it's not just the words. It's what's going on. This Yov is a righteous man, apparently, and then he has issues. He has complaints. His friends talk to him. God does not approve of what the friends say until finally Elihu gets involved, who's younger than everybody else, and shares with them what they're missing. And even though it's not said in clear words, the theme, the theme of reincarnation is insinuated. The topic of Gilgul Neshamot is pretty much hinted in the words of Elihu, that many things happen to people as a result of a previous life, a previous reincarnation. And this topic of Gilgul Neshamot really is more covered in depth in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism. However, there's definitely mention of it, the Remes, at least on the level called Remes. As you know, the Torah has various levels or layers. And one of them is Remes and Sod, things that are hinted, things that are embedded, the secrets behind the words being said. Tehillim is not an exception. Tehillim was divinely inspired. It's not just words that he makes up. He was in the mood of singing. This is Ruach HaKodesh, divinely inspired. And if you really follow it, you can see that it is. It's just not only beautiful, it's so deep. And for David Amela to say things about the future, we know then it must be prophetic as well. Well, prophecy, divine inspiration, even though they're different, they're very much pretty much the same. So here we're talking about the future. What will be in the future? The future is that everybody will come to understand that this God has always been around. He created the world. And why does he do certain things? We will have a better understanding not only because he will reveal himself, but as we will see, there's even mention indirectly that there will be no more Yetzerara. At the time Mashiach comes, sometime afterwards, evil will cease to exist, and included in the camp of evil is the evil inclination. Amalek, all that which belongs to the camp of Ra, of evil. So once you remove the evil inclination, once you see the truth, once you're able to sense reality, not just to believe, but to sense it, then everything will be made so much clearer. We will understand God's ways, how they're just, how they're perfect, how they all make sense. And that is what David Melech says later on, our mouths will be full of laughter and joy when we realize how mistaken we were or how we should have known better. It will be a very, very pleasant surprise to those who believed in it, but it will be a big shocker to those who had doubts. As I explained before, the rabbi said that to some, the coming of the Mashiach is compared to the sting of a scorpion, and to others, it is compared as finding a lost object. Imagine you lost your wedding ring that you've had for so many years, and after a very long time, you finally find it again. It's very, very happy, no? It's a very happy occasion. Or even better than that, a wedding ring is just a ring. What about a brother and sisters who each thought of each other that they were dead? Real stories that happened after the Holocaust. 50 years they didn't see each other. 50 years they thought the other one was dead, not alive. To come back together, could you imagine the, the tears, the joy in each one? It's incredible. And so this coming of the Mashiach is much more than that. We have no idea. After all, Tchiyat Metim is part of the process that the dead will rise. Well, what? I can't believe it. I thought you drowned in the sea. I thought you were eaten by the sharks. I thought you were burned to ashes in the crematoriums of Auschwitz. Nothing happened to you. You're all there. You're the same. Do you know what this will do to people? Well, it was just a bad dream we had. <laughs> That's what it will be. So in Tehillim, a lot of that is being expressed to instill in us the hope in realizing that there's so much we don't know. And Hashem is all chesed, is all full of kindness. And even when he does something that appears to us not to be 
so good. It's only our perception, and perceptions can be deceiving. When the truth comes out, we will realize what Hashem is all about. So at that day, when Mashiach comes, during that time, during that period of time, when the, when the Bet HaMidash will be rebuilt as well, Hashem will be great. He will be exalted. He will be, <coughs> he will be acclaimed. Where will this be? Where will all this take place? Where will be the center of all attention? Be'ir Elokeinu. Not in Los Angeles. Not in Hollywood. <laughs> it's Be'ir Elokeinu. It's in Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim will be the capital of the world. Not Manhattan. No. Not uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> Be'ir Elokeinu. That was always God's city. That's the center. Har Kocho, the mountain of His Holiness or this holy mountain, which means the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. That's the center. That is where the Jews pray towards to, in that direction. Because that's the center, even though Hashem really fills the entire universe. He's everywhere. But there's a center. There's a center where we need to focus on. In that center, the entire world will focus on when Mashiach comes. Pasu Gimel. Yefenof mesos kol How beautiful it will be the landscape, Nof is landscape, even though others interpret it a little bit differently. The simple translation is, it will be a beautiful landscape, a beautiful sight to behold. Mesos kola aretz, the joy of the whole earth, of the whole earth, not of only the Jewish people, not only of the land, even though it says the land, the land does not necessarily mean Israel. Here it means the whole earth. Har Tzion, where is that joy? It's in the mountain of Zion. In other words, that is where the source of the joy is coming from. That is what is causing everybody to be so, so happy. Yerketei Tzafon, another description of that location that brings joy. Yerketei Tzafon, a very interesting description. It's talking about the Mizbech, the altar, on the northern slopes. Or really, the, the better translation will be on the northern side, which wears where the korbanot, the sacrifices, were, were offered on the Mizbeach. What, what does this have to do with this verse? Another, perhaps, another explanation as to what the source of joy is. You know what that Mizbeach did when we had it? It helped it to atone for sins. A person who was unfortunately immersed in sin for many years, he's regretful, he's remorseful, he feels bad. The fact that he knows that Hashem is forgiving, the fact that he knows that he can bring a korban and sacrifice, and confess and commit himself, of course. It's not just the animal. Remember, sacrifices is, are symbolic. It's the whole process of repentance, of confession, of commitment to the future, and the sacrifice. Altogether, the fact that we can do it again, not that we will need it too much, because after Mashiach comes, there won't be an evil inclination, but the fact that we can take care of our past misdeeds, that will also be a joy. After all, the Bet HaMikdash, the service of Hashem, what went on there, the korbanot, the menorah, all of that was very, very special. It was very important. As the Midrash says, had the non-Jewish world understood how much blessing, how much shefa and beracha comes from that location, they would never have destroyed it. They would have put 24-hour guards to surround the, the temple. If they only knew what came out, how much good came out from that location. So that is why he, he insinuates here, you know what the source of joy from this place is. It's not just the landscape, it's not what you will only see, but it's Yarketet Safon, and that will be Kiryat Melech Rav. That will be the city, Kiryat, of the great king. Hashem chose that place, Hashem chose that location. That is where the temple is built, that is where the Shekhinah, the Holy Divine Presence, resides. And that is why we still go to the Kotan Amaravi, to the Western Wall, which is the closest wall to the Kodesh HaKodashim, to the Holy of Holies. That's the only remnant, the main remnant of the Second Temple that we still have today. So there is a, there is a continuation from the past to the future, uninterrupted, even though right now there appears to be nothing there, but there's still something there for a good reason. Why was the Kotel Amaravi left? There's a link. We should not lose this link to that location. That place is where the Bet HaMikdash stood. 
That is where it will be rebuilt. That is therefore the Kiryat Melechlav. That is the city of the great king. Pasuk Dalet. Elohim Bermenotea no Dalem is Gav. God in his Armenotea, Armenotea in his palaces, in the citadels, became known as a tower of strength. The word Mizgav is seen a lot in Tehillim, as a source or as a tower of strength. At that point, as the Bet Amidash is being built, as well as in, in the hills of the war of, of Gog Magog, as a result of all the great miracles that will occur there, Hashem will be known as a tower of strength. What does tower of strength mean? What does it have to do with this? Part of the worship of Hashem involves Yirat Hashem, the fear of God. If the human being would properly fear God, not only would he have a relationship with Him, not only would he continue to pray to him, observe his commandments, it would help him not to sin, not to commit any transgressions. Yirat Hashem. In order to be properly convinced or impressed of the greatness of Hashem, one either has to learn the Torah and see it firsthand, or to experience it in some very, very... Uh, earth-shattering way, you know, some very frightening way that brings him to, to fear, to tears. People have experienced Hashem in different ways. The most powerful time the Jewish people experienced Hashem was Matan Torah, which we just read about, Pashat Yitro. It was clear to them, they heard God's voice. Never has a people, as a whole, as a group, heard Hashem's voice. So, it was easier for them to relate to this God. And even then, remember after many, many years, generations later, people forget they were not there physically to recall Hashem's voice. And therefore, the Yir'ah diminishes. When the Yir'ah, the fear for God, diminishes, people are capable of doing all kinds of things. At that point, when Mashiach comes, when Hashem reveals Himself, by seeing the Bet Amidash, which is really part of Hashem's Amenotea, part of Hashem's citadels, but it's in the plural because it's talking about the rebuilding of the entire city of Yerushalayim. What will we see? We will see a city that once laid in ruins for so long, a very long diaspora, almost 2,000 years. We will see Elohim Bar Menotea. Wow! He's revealing himself in a grand way. He's rebuilding the city that was destroyed. He's bringing back the children that he kicked out, that were in exile for so long. The whole rebuilding of Yerushalayim, therefore, will bring a sense of fear, a sense of strength, really. In this case, Nodale Mizgav, we can trust him. We, we could have trusted him all the time. He's delivering on what he promised. So Nodale Mizgav, the entire world will see, will witness all the miracles, not only us, Everybody will witness the miracles. The miracle of the Jewish people coming back, the miracle of the land being rebuilt, the Yushalayim being rebuilt. It will be so impressive that we will see the Mizgav, the source of strength that Hashem is. Yeah. We should have relied on Him and trusted Him and not had any worries and any qualms, any doubts. So when this happens, Elohim Bar Menoteha, in all the citadels, in all the towers, in all the palaces that will come up, that will be built up, we will see the source of strength, where it comes from. How the Jewish people were able to withstand all the years of exile and troubles and persecution. Who gave them that power? How could they still exist after so many years? So many nations have disappeared from the scene and we're still around. The Mizgav. He has been the source of strength, not we. We're weak. What can we do? Right? It's like the famous Mashal of a sheep surrounded by 70 wolves. You think the sheep is strong if it gets away with it? No. no. It's the shepherd, Hashem, who's protecting that sheep. It's always been like that, but not everybody realized that. So if God will become known, Lemizgav, as the source of the strength, as a tower of strength, 
to the Jewish people and to the rest of the world. They will see, they will become aware of this. Pasuk hey, who exactly will become aware? Even the kings. As we said in, the, in an earlier chapter, Ki no'adu Behold, the kings assembled, and they advanced together, Yahdav. For what purpose did they, did they advance together? To invade her. This is clearly talking about Gog Magog, the last major war in the world that will be directed against Yerushalayim. Many kings, many nations will be involved. They're assembled. And what's interesting about this, remember, Tehillim is not really Nevi'im, it's Ketuvim, it's not prophets, it's scriptures. And here we have prophetic visions about Gog Magog, which Yehaskel, Zechariah speak about, other prophets speak about. And here he's throwing at us certain Pesukim that have to do with that, with that major war. Because it's a major war. After that war, what will happen? It gadal vid kadash shem Hashem's name will be sanctified in the entire world. So that is, it's a major event in the history of mankind. So all the kings will gather together to invade Jerusalem, but they will, they are in for a big surprise. This will be a big, big surprise. The most surprising thing about Gog and Magog is that Hashem will convince everybody that what wins the war is Hashem. It's not the ammunition you have, it's not the weapons you have, it's not the missiles or the planes, it's Hashem. How do you convince people? The Six Day War was a miraculous war. Not everybody was convinced. People thought that it was incredible. It was, they say, a miracle. How could the Jewish people, surrounded by so many enemies, be victorious in six days against so many armies? But. There's always room for doubt. After all, we have free will. The whole idea of having free will is to, to make things not too obvious so that we can choose on our own. We're not robots. Shem wants us to choose on our own, to believe and to do the right thing. But when Mashiach comes, the free will will pretty much go away. It will not be as strong as it is right now because things will be obvious to us. And Hashem will convince everybody by performing miracles very similar, or I should say even greater than, than Egypt. In many ways, those miracles would be very great miracles in order to convince everybody that this is not an act of nature, something so miraculous that everybody will say, this is the hand of God. So these people who will attempt to invade in the war of Gog Magog, Yerushalayim, what will happen to them? Pasuk Vav. They saw the wonders of Hashem and they were astounded. Tamahu. They were puzzled, maybe. They were terror stricken. And they rushed to get away. Nechpazu means to rush and to get away. What happened? <laughs> They obviously don't need to be convinced. They obviously see that Hashem is on the Jews' side. This will not be a, t a time to attempt in every way, as in the past kings have attempted in any way to take over the land. They will get the message very clearly. He doesn't go into detail as what will happen, even though we covered a little bit of the detail before, but all the details is left for Yechezkel and Zechariah, what will happen during that battle. But at least it gives us an idea that the nations, when they see all that grandeur of Hashem, of, of the land of Israel, when they see all the miracles, they will do the right thing. They will, <laughs> they will get out of the way. But it says they will be astounded. You know what astounded means? Wow, we were wrong all along. We had, our, we had the wrong ideas about these Jews. Many of them thought that the Jews were punished never to come back to Israel, never to have their temple rebuilt. That's it, they were banished, they misbehaved, but they were wrong. God never divorced the Jewish people. You can call it a brief separation, even though it's not so brief, but that's what it is. It's a separation which appears like a divorce. I mean, if you go by appearances, yes, 
But now when Mashiach comes back, what happened? Well, even a person who divorces is allowed to take back his wife unless he's a Kohen. Right? Change his mind, they both change their mind. I wish it for all the divorcees that they should realize that maybe they are really meant for each other and they should you know, think things over again. That it's not necessarily a good thing what they did to get divorced, especially if they have children. But our relationship with Hashem suffered. It's our fault. We are to blame. And we paid for it dearly. But Hashem made a promise. And He's going to keep that promise regardless. Mashiach is going to come regardless. How He comes is a different story. As I've, as I've always said, Mashiach can come as a natural birth or as a C-section, which is more painful. We don't want it to be a C-section. We want it to be Berachamim Dolim with tremendous compassion. We've suffered enough. So many of us, of course, will be overjoyed. But the reaction, initially at least, of those who came to invade her will be astounded. They will be in shock, completely shocked. They will not even know what's happening to them. What's going on over here? Where are all these meteorites coming from? This is not just an earthquake or a tsunami that can happen. These are things that don't happen every day. In other words, as the prophets describe, there will be something from Shemaim, something from heaven that will come down, something that will will leave them very, very shocked and come to the realization that this must be from God. So all that they will experience, all that they will witness will be supernatural, as they would say in English, not natural. In order to be convinced, they would have to be out of this world. Pasuk Zayn. What else will happen to them? Re'ada hazatam. It's a little bit of a continuation. Pasuk Zayn says, that they will be trembling. Trembling will seize them over there. Chil kayoleda. They will have pangs as of a woman going through labor. Chil kayoleda. Okay, trembling we understand. They have what to tremble. But why talk about the pangs a woman has while she's about to go through, when she's going through labor? Even though I just said, the Messianic era is compared to that. There are pangs of labor for the Jewish people, for the entire world, actually, there are pangs of labor. But here it's more in association with the last battle, the end of days when the enemies that come to invade will be very fearful. They will tremble, and what they will be experiencing is similar to the pangs of a woman going through labor. <coughs> Would you like to suggest why it's compared to the pangs of a woman going through labor. I gotta ask the women about that. Huh? <laughs> when you have children, what it's like. All I know, all I know, and all I've heard, it's very painful. Okay? It's very painful. You want to get it over with. But I have a different interpretation of why he says the pangs of labor. I think it, I think the Baal Shem Tov used to say that some people think they can run away from their pain and suffering. You know, if you move to a different city, you, if it's coming to a person, if it has been decreed that he go through a painful experience, you can't run away from it. Unless, of course, he does Teshuvah and he prays to Hashem, perhaps he cancels the decree. So the Baal Shem Tov says as follows, you know why you can't run from, away from it? It's just like a pregnant woman who's having pain labor pains. Can she run away from it? Wherever she will go, she will take with her her pregnancy, her labor pains. Wherever she goes, she takes it with her. So I thought perhaps why he uses this term here, this metaphor, is to describe how they will not be able to hide from him. Wherever they go, he's going to get them. Those that need to be punished, those that need to be taught a lesson will be taught a lesson no matter where they go. So they will be experiencing the pangs of a woman going through labor, regardless of where she is. She will feel it. Regardless of where they are, they will feel it. That's my way of interpreting. Otherwise, why use that to describe the pain that they're going through? Yes, they will have reason to fear, but they will be going through pain? Yes, because no matter where they go, they will not be safe. Pasuk Chet. Meruach Kadim Teshaber Oniyot Tarshish. 
this is a continuation of, I guess you could say, the previous two or three Pesukim in talking about how they will be crushed. They will be defeated. It will come about by an easterly wind, Beruach Kadim. This Ruach Kadim, Teshaber Oniyot Tarshish, it shatters the ships, the boats of Tarshish. Tarshish is in the Mediterranean, so I think the best way to understand this Pasuk is in the same way that this wind blows and causes tremendous havoc with boats in the Mediterranean Sea. This is a sea that Israel is familiar with. This is the large ocean right outside of Israel, and that is why he uses this as an example. But it could be any ocean where there's a major storm going on. But think about a, a moment about the words Ruach Kadim. Now, Ruach Kadim is mentioned in the Torah various times, an easterly wind. So, that many times in describing a very powerful storm or some punishment, coming from Hashem directly, the term of Ruach Kadim is used. Why an easterly wind? What's wrong with it? Why not a westerly wind? A northerly wind? A southern wind? These winds from every direction. Depending where you are, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, around the equator, you will see, you will experience winds going different directions. You have what's called the trade winds, which the sailors many times used to get from the east to the west. In certain parts of the globe where you see them. When you get on a plane, you will notice sometimes what's called a, a headwind or a tailwind. A headwind is against you, a tailwind is behind you. So if you're going with a tailwind, you're going to go faster, get to your destination a lot quicker. If you have a headwind coming against you, then it's going to be slower. You're pushing against a headwind. But a headwind also has some benefits when you're taking off the draft. It's better. But when it comes to powerful winds, strong winds, especially hurricanes, they are formed by usually by easterly winds. Even though they can turn westerly, in a westerly direction, in other words, from west to east, Usually, they go from east to west. That is what an easterly wind is, and that is how hurricanes form, wherever they form, in the Atlantic, or even in the Pacific. They're sometimes, depending where they are, called cyclones, sometimes hurricanes. They go in that direction. So the powerful winds, this is the way I see it, some of the most powerful winds are from east to west. Therefore, that term, Ruach Kadim, is used. Otherwise, why use easterly wind? Now, if you want to get deeper about this and go into the Kabbalah, then east has to do with, with a certain sefirot or with certain attributes of God, perhaps. But we don't need to get into that. The simple understanding here is that it is similar to something that we can identify with, an easterly wind that comes and breaks or, or drowns the ships in the, in the Mediterranean Sea or in any sea. So this event of their defeat, of their crushing, will come to them like an easterly wind that shatters the, the ships of Tarshish. It was very, very powerful, something that they cannot defend against. Pasuk Tet. כאשר שמענו, כן ראינו בעיר אדוני צבאות, בעיר אלוהינו, אלוהים יכונני עד עולם סבא. Beautiful פסוק, in describing how we will see that it's all true. Everything that we were told to, everything that we were told, fulfilled itself. כאשר שמענו, כן ראינו. In the exact same way that we heard. Heard from our forefathers, we heard from the prophets, we read their words. Ken Raino, we will see it, hopefully we, and our children and grandchildren too. In the same way we heard it, in the same way we read it, we will have seen it. 
and it all coming together Be'ir Hashem Tzevakot Be'ir Eloheinu coming together in the city of Hashem Tzevakot is Hashem the God of, of hosts of the many armies of angels that he has the city of our God Be'ir Eloheinu Elohim Yechonenea Ad Olam Sela and Hashem will establish it for all eternity once he establishes it and you it will be for all eternity. It will never be destroyed again. I was thinking a lot about this Pasuk. Why is he emphasizing here that this time the city will be established? Ad Olam Sela. Obviously, it's telling us it's eternal. It's for eternity. But what, why emphasize that? I recall, I don't recall myself, but I, I was told by my father and others who were around when the Nazis were about to enter Israel. They were threatening to continue on from North Africa or from Syria and enter Israel. And that was a very, very dangerous time, very, very uh, anxious time for the Jewish people in Israel. They were, they were trembling. Many of them were getting ready to leave, especially the prime minister and the other ministers, the secular Jews, the government, when they offered the rabbis, the chief rabbi and other rabbis, a diplomatic passport to leave, the general consensus of the, what the rabbis said was, we're not leaving, we're staying. Why? From all we know is that there will never be a third destruction. It's not written in any book that there will be a Bait Shlishi Churban again. No destruction, no third temple will be destroyed. The Jewish people are not going back out into the diaspora. We've been exiled several times. Our home was burned down twice, but that's it. It doesn't ever say anymore that this will repeat itself. Once we come home, we're here to stay. Yes, there may be battles. We had wars. It may be difficult till Mashiach comes, but no third destruction of a temple or a home. We're not leaving. And if you know the history, you know, the Nazis were stopped in a miraculous way in North Africa. They never continued. And the way it happened was also a miraculous way, the way the British were able to stop them. It wasn't easy. It's all Mishnah Maim, it's all from heaven. So therefore, when he reestablishes the city and the, and, the, and the children come back home, it's Yechonedea Ad Olam Sela, it will be for eternity, it will be forever. But what's really, really interesting here is that he's reminding us nothing that you've read or you were told is exaggerated. Kasher Shamanu Ken Rainu, it's exactly the way we were told. And there's several Gemarot and Midrashim that tell us in detail what the Bet Hamidash will look like, the precious stones that will cover it, how beautiful it will be, the era that we will live in when Mashiach arrives. Kasher Shamanu Ken Ra'inu, the way we were told, the way that is the way it will be. No one ever lied to you, no one ever exaggerated to you. That's exactly the way it will be when Mashiach comes. Next Pasuk. Diminu Elohim Chazdecha Bekerev Echalecha. This is also a little bit of a continuation of what we just said. We have been hoping for your kindness to be revealed within your hechalecha, your sanctuary. We've been hoping, we've been looking forward. What's this all about? Well, obviously we're all looking forward, or are we all looking forward? There is a big difference big difference between those who looked forward and those who did not look forward. It's not just about being surprised like being bit or stung by the a scorpion or being overjoyed to find a lost honor. This is a lot deeper than that. The rabbis tell us something very, very interesting. Whoever mourns properly over Jerusalem will merit to see it rebuilt. Will merit to see the consolation. That's very, very nice. In other words, those who mourned properly on Tisha Be'av throughout the year, looked forward for Mashiach to come, they will get to see it. They will rejoice when it's rebuilt. 
I have a question, and it's not only my question, the commentary says, but wait a minute. What about all those Jews that mourned property for Yerushalayim, looked forward to Mashiach, and died? When will they merit to see Besim Chata? When it will be rebuilt, when it will be rebuilt, when everybody will be overjoyed to see it restored again. They're dead. So I gave several explanations. Explanation number one is that those who properly mourned for Yerushalayim during their life while they were alive, when they get up in Tchiyat HaMetim, after all they'll get up, they will be from the first to get up. According to the Kabbalah, Tchiyat HaMetim takes 40 years for all the dead to rise. Not everybody gets up at the same time. Who will get up first? Those who will get to enjoy, to merit, to see the reestablishment of Yerushalayim, the Bet Hamidash, and enjoy every moment. They get up first because they mourned over Yerushalayim. So it's talking about who will get up first. Number two, it could also be the level or degree of reward that they will have when they see it rebuilt. Maybe they will be on a higher level, they'll enjoy it more. But the third explanation is really the explanation that is given by the Kabbalists, which I very much uh, subscribe to. I think it's really the, the more important explanation, even though the other ones are true as well. And that is, it is very likely, very possible, that those who truly mourn for Yerushalayim, Hashem will bring them back in a reincarnation, a Gilgul, right before Mashiach comes. They will be the ones in the last generation to be alive, to see Mashiach's arrival. After all, to see Mashiach's arrival, you need a special merit. Not everybody will have that merit to see him arrive and to live through it. It's like having front seats. You want a front seat? You, you, you got to pay a lot of money for it. So those who mourn for Yerushalayim will have front seats. Either they will come back in the reincarnation and be around during that time, or they will get up earlier. Whichever you want, they definitely will see it more. On them, that pasuk is perhaps being said, Diminu elokim hasdecha. We looked forward, we were hoping for your kindness to be revealed within your sanctuary. What kindness? That you, that you promised us, that you will restore it, despite our sins. That's chesed. Your promise despite our sins, that's pure chesed. Bekere vechalecha in the midst of your sanctuary. You know, it was, that's the main thing that we're looking forward to. It's not just coming back home. It's seeing the Shekinah reside amongst us, seeing the Bet HaMikdash being rebuilt. Pasuk Yud Aleph. Keshimcha Elohim kenti ilatecha al katzvei eretz tzedek malea yiminecha. As your name, Hashem, so is is your praise al katzvei aratz al katzvei aratz to the end of the earth tzedek malayim necha your right hand is filled with righteousness who's who is he talking about over here he's talking about the rest of the world not only the jewish people that keshim chai lokim as your name is as people will get to know you, your praise will be al eretz, to the ends of the earth. It was everybody will praise you. Everybody will know you. Not only the Jewish people. What is he adding over here? He's adding that everybody will know Hashem or will understand His ways and will finally come to the conclusion, a very important conclusion, now we understand, Tzedek Malei Minecha. Your right hand has always been a hand of justice, of righteousness. Even that which appeared to us as pain, even though that which appeared to us as so difficult, now we will understand, the whole world will understand, how great you are, how, how, how praiseworthy you are, because Tzedek Malei Minecha. Now we understand that your right hand, your right hand, that's, that's tremendously 
powerful hand that, that is used in many, many ways to describe Hashem's interaction with this world. Yemin Hashem Osechayim, the right hand of Hashem. The right really refers to Chesed. But here he's emphasizing Tzedek, Male'ah. Your right hand is full of Tzedek. In other words, what you've been doing all along is just, it's correct. We're not talking about someone who's corruptible, Halila, God forbid. We're not talking about someone who changes his mind. God is not human. It's all Tzedek. Atsur Tamim Paolo, the rock, is complete, is pure, he's just, he's righteous. That is what everybody will come to realize. He begins with Kishim Chai Elohim. Elohim is usually associated with judgment. But your praise will, will be one that is based on the realization that it's all tzedek. Even judgment is tzedek. Judgment, harsh, it's tzedek yeminecha. That will be reason to praise Hashem when everybody will understand that Hashem is all about tzedek. Pasuk Yud Bet Yisma Har Tzion Tagelna Benot Yehuda Leman Mishpatecha Let the mountain of, of Tzion rejoice and let the towns of Yehuda Benot Yehuda here could be translated as the towns let them exalt because of your judgment Leman Mishpatecha because of your judgment The towns of Yehuda, Har Tzion. He's talking about something inanimate here. He's talking about the rocks. He's talking about the buildings, the cities. Not so much about the people here. Why? So there's two ways of looking at it. One is that the rabbis tell us we will understand that we have reason to be thankful to Hashem that His wrath, His anger, was only poured on the rocks and stones. The Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, the Jewish people are still alive. Imagine if somebody gives you a choice, I, bur I burn your house down or I, I, I put you to death. <laughs> the house, the house can go, but because the house we can always rebuild. If a person dies, we can't bring it back. Our atonement, our kapara, was that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed and we were exiled, but we're still around. Even though a lot of us, of course, suffered greatly, many Jews were killed too, but the Jewish people are still around. So, because of your justice, what was the justice that you, you put your wrath on the stones and not on the Jewish people themselves? But there's more to this. When Mashiach comes, an important prophecy will be fulfilled. The prophecy of uh, Zechariah. If you recall, there's a famous Gemara. The Talmud says that Rabbi Kiva and his friends were walking by the ruins of the Bet HaMikdash and they saw a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies. And the friends, the colleagues of Rabbi Kiva were in we're mournful, we're sad to see something like this where the Bet HaMikdash once stood. Now there's a whole bunch of, of stones and fox running around it. And Rabbi Kiva was smiling. Rabbi Kiva, why are you smiling? What are you so happy about? He says, why are you so sad about? They said, we? We have reason to be sad. Look at the site. This is where the, we had the temple and it's in ruins now. That's exactly why I'm happy, he says. If the prophecy of Uriah, who talks about how this place where the temple stood will be plowed under, if his negative prophecy came true, now I know that all the good prophecies of Zechariah and others will also come true. And what are those? some of those prophecies? That very soon, once again, there will be elderly Jews, men and women, sitting in the streets of Jerusalem and children frolicking about. So do we see that today? 
Had we been talking about this 150 years ago in uh, Borujerd or in Sanandaj <laughs> or any city you want, yeah? you say, Rabbi, we have maybe a lot, many, many years to go before this comes true. There were more camels and donkeys in Israel than the human being, than people, the Jews, than anybody, than people. But today, it's already true. Over six million Jews have come home. This is not kibbutz galiot. I don't know what is. The gathering is happening. It's being rebuilt. All the all the swamps, I think, just about all of them, have been dried up. The infrastructure is being laid out. The airport has been expanded. Roads continuously being widened. What is all this? Isma hartzion tagelna benot yuda. The time will come that we will have reason to be happy because we will see all the good prophecies coming true. If the bad ones came true, the good ones will come true as well, like Rabbi Akiva said. And that's exactly the case. That's what he's talking about here. We will be overjoyed to see it with our own eyes. Because of your judgments, meaning we will realize that it was all your judgment that was involved in that this is the way it needed to be. Walk around Sion and circle her, count her towers. This is also a little interesting. Surround her, go around her, count the towers. There's very interesting Midrashim about this Basuk. I'll just tell you one of them, one detail. Yerushalayim will be so beautiful, so much larger and grander, that there will be 1,184 gardens. Just one little detail, but many, many towers, many palaces in that city that will be much greater than anything we can imagine. Now, even though we see Yerushalayim built up today, the rabbis tell us, no, don't think that that is Yerushalayim that Mashiach is talking about. Once the Bet HaMikdash is rebuilt, then we can talk about Yerushalayim being rebuilt. Before that, it doesn't count. So even though you see today, wow, it's beautiful, right? You see five-star hotels too. Huh? A lot of nice establishments, Hoshim with many, many yeshivot as well. This is still not rebuilt. We will see it rebuilt when the Bet HaMikdash is rebuilt. When the Bet HaMikdash is standing, Yerushalayim is rebuilt, or begins to be rebuilt. So that time, Sobu Tziyom Vakifua, go ahead. Walk around it in a circle and then counter towers. In other words, begin to see what it will be like. In the next Pasuk, which is somewhat of a continuation, is very, very puzzling because he says as follows Pasuk Yudalet, Shituli Bechem Lechela, Pasegu Arminotea. Consider well her, some say Lechela is her ramparts, but not necessarily. I'm going to tell you a different interpretation for that. Consider well. Pay, pay attention, look around, Pasegur Menotea, behold, or look at her lofty, her high citadels. Lemante saperu le dora haron that you, so you may can recount it to a later generation. You know what? I had the hardest time with this pasuk of the entire chapter. If this is talking about to the last generation, of Mashiach, look around, take a look. Then why is he saying Lemante Saperu Le Dona Haron so you can recount this to a later generation? There is no later generation. I mean, I mean there will be, but they're all see, they're gonna all they're gonna all be around, they're gonna all see it. If you see it, they'll see it. See how it doesn't make so much sense? I'm surprised that no one really talked about it except for the Al Sheikh, the commentary Al Sheikh Akadosh. He, I think he, he's got he's got it on the on the on the mark. He says that David Amelech of Nekorah they're talking about the first and second temple. They're talking about the people living during the first and second temple era. And the word lehaila means the tremendous masses, the great population. Millions of people who used to come, aliyah la regel, three times a year. Whenever it was crowded, it was crowded, but no one ever complained. No no one ever complained about it being too congested in Yerushalayim to sleep over, to be there. Everybody felt so good coming there, even though there were millions of people. How could a city, who was not, which was not so big then, hold so many people? 
So that is why he's saying like this, Shitul libechem lechela. Look, pay attention to the masses now. First temple, second temple era, Pasegur. Look at what you see, what you behold now, the towers. You see how small it is? Nonetheless, it holds so many people. If these are the miracles that you're witnessing now, that the small city is not congested, even though millions of people are there, the more so it will be miraculous when the time comes. Tell your children, tell the future generation, you have no reason to fear. You're going to see greater miracles. If we saw them back then, you will see it for sure. So he's talking to the first or second temple era people. Behold what you see now. So you can recount it to a generation right before Mashiach who may be pessimistic, who may be depressed, who may be sad and hopeless. No, you will see greater miracles if we saw them back then, the more so that you will see it. To me, that sounds like a better interpretation. Then, then he's not just talking about to the last generation, he's talking about to the first and second temple era people. The last verse is, Ki ze Elohim hu Elohenu hu olam va'ed hu yina ageno almud, for this God is our God forever. Olam va'ed. Hu yina ageno almud, he will lead us eternally. Some inter uh, interpret the words almud, meaning forever, like you would say le'olam. Some say Almut is like Alamot, as though it's one word, as when we were young, as when he took us out of Egypt, as he slowly but surely led us. So he will do it this time again, take us in his hands, lead the way, and take care of us. Either way, they're both, they're both are correct. When the time comes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will not only demonstrate it to the entire world that he's our God, he will also lead us once again in the same way that he led us in the past. Which means that in this case, not only will he perform miracles, this time around, however, it will be eternal. What will be eternal? Once I remove the Yetzer the evil inclination, you will no longer have the evil inclination to rebel against him. So therefore, from this point on, Elokeinu olam va'ed. He is a God. He will be with us for eternity. Bezat Hashem. Very, very soon. The segula of this perek, the special powers that this chapter has, as we've said all along, the Tehilim has special powers, whether you read the entire book, little by little, or whether you read certain specific chapters. Each chapter has something very unique about it that if said especially repeatedly, it, depending on how it is said, I'm not giving you all the details of the segula, but just what it's for. That there, sometimes it has to be said in a certain way, or said a number in a, in a said it more than once. This particular perek is very, very good to make an enemy be afraid of you. <laughs> if you have someone who is not afraid, and you should be afraid, you don't want him to bother you. This perek is good for that. There are other chapters that are good for all kinds of situations that people may have troubles with neighbors or with enemies of all kinds. And we've gone through some of them, and there's more. This is just one of them that is helpful for that. Remember, prayer is a powerful tool, a very powerful tool we have. It's the most powerful tool that we have to be able to seek Hashem's protection in all kinds of situations. So even if your mazal is not too good, mazal, and mazal is pretty strong. One's destiny and fate are pretty much attached to him. He lives with that. But we are above the Mazal. If we pray to God, Teshuvat, Filaut, Tzedakama, Rimit, it is through the power of prayer, through the power of repentance, through the power of charity that we can annul decrees. Decrees. So we must never forget, Shem, we will see tremendous Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Amen.